same day with him? Good morning. Good to see everybody. When I hear that uh, that song, Who Am I? I've often thought of that. Who am I that God would pour out His uh, grace through faith to me and I might be saved? But God had a purpose for me and I didn't know it. He had a purpose for me and I didn't even want to know it before I was saved. And uh, praise God that He is Faithful to do the things that he intends to do. Praise the Lord. Welcome to those that are in video land today. And uh, this is uh, White Springs Baptist Church. And, and we uh, are looking forward to uh, the Spirit of God working in us. Let's have a prayer before we start and then we'll go from there. Father, thank you today for an opportunity to be of service to you. It is most important that we be doing the things that we're supposed to do to glorify you. It doesn't have to be a lot, it just has to be whatever it is God wants. And we need to find out what God wants, each one of us, here and in other places uh, that uh, need to be worked on by us to, uh, to do the things he wants for us to do. So we just praise you for uh, uh, coming here today or listening on the on video or whatever the case may be that that we uh, be together in unity in seeking God's will for us in our lives. Touch this message and bless it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Um, in Job 14.1 it says uh, man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. Um, and that is true, and that is a uh, epitaph, or really it's a Job's summation of his life. In other words, uh, life is not uh, rosy all the time. I remember that song, Rose Colored Glasses, from a hundred years ago, it seemed like. And, uh, and I never had any of those rose colored glasses, but uh, uh, at any rate, people do. And they use that as an excuse sometimes or as a lament for life being uh, terrible. And now, in Job's case, uh, life had turned sour on him a little bit. Well, not a little bit, a whole lot. Uh, he uh, was lamenting in chapter 3. So we're going to be in chapter 3. And we'll call this the lament of uh, Job. And he is sorrowful for his life. And really, uh, he wishes that uh, he had died at birth. Uh, he didn't want to have life. He was uh, sorrowful in, in his life because of the things that had happened to him. He, he lost uh, all that he had. Uh, his, uh, uh, his children were all taken. And uh, all of his possessions, his uh, cattle, his... Uh, uh, sheep and camels and things of that nature and his uh, servants that took care of those and uh, and then he was afflicted with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet and I've had a boil, boil or two and uh, they're not much fun and if you were covered with them it would be something else altogether so he was having much sorrow in chapter 3 he is, uh, in chapter 3, he is lamenting his miserable condition. Um, if we look at chapter 3 and verse 3, he says, Let the day perish wherein I was born, <laughs> excuse me, and the night in which I, it was said, there is a man-child conceived. In other words, uh, he cursed his day, the day that he was uh, born, and he uh, lamented that he was still alive. In verse, uh, uh, in verse 11, he says, Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not, or why did I not give, give up the ghost when I came out of, out of the belly? In other words, why was I not able to just give up my life? Now, I don't know about you, 
there's been a time in my life when I, I particularly had wished that I had not lived or was not alive. Now, I never contemplated suicide, but I sure lamented the life that I had created for myself and, uh, and for others that were involved with me. And so I can understand that lament, that sorrow for that. It is a great sorrow uh, to have other people's lives uh, uh, affected by your life and, and how you've lived it and that sort of thing. So he is lamenting this. He's sorrowful for this. We could read on and on and on and just see more and more of the same thing. Now in chapter 4, uh, Eliphaz, one of his so-called friends, you can put the quotation marks on his name because he's a so-called friend. And uh, he wasn't much of a friend though. None of those that were speaking with Job during this time of trial, uh, who were supposed to be his friends, were much of a friend. Uh, they did a lot of criticizing. They attacked him and did some things that uh, are not the things that should have been done to help him get through this. Eliphaz uh, makes a revealing statement, uh, but it applies to not only to Job, but it applies to us. And, you know, there's some things you learn from Job that are not just about Job. It's about how to live life when life is not really what you wanted it to be. And that can be a lot sometimes. And other times it can be better. But this particular case, he was in the uh, throes of that. And in verse 3 of, uh, verse of chapter 4, it says this, Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Now, what he's saying there is, Behold, you have, you have instructed. Now, you know that, that Job was a man who was righteous before God. God said that uh, to him uh, in chapter 2 and verse 3. We'll read it in a minute. But he was a man that was a righteous man. He lived right as much as he could. And he uh, uh, did things that God needed done. And, and he was a man that was uh, honored in his community. They thought greatly of him uh, and so forth. And, and uh, when they saw his condition... Uh, they, they couldn't believe the condition that he was in. You know, when he was uh, sitting there in ashes and sackcloth and his boils were just all over and his uh, so-called friends, when they saw him, they fell on their faces and, uh, and uh, lamented over his uh, physical condition. And I understand that. And... Uh, Job dealt with many people. You know, people used to come to him because he was an elder. He may have been the elder at that time. Many people believe that Job is the first book of the Bible. I happen to be one of them. And uh, it transcends uh, all the, uh, uh, with the exception of the account of uh, uh, the, the creation of the world uh, and so forth. That part of Genesis, but right after that. Uh, shortly after that, I believe Job kicks in. But anyway, uh, Job dealt with many people who were having trials in life as an elder. You know, that's, that's the way it used to be. People called the pastor or called the elder or whatever and said, uh, I'm really struggling with something and uh, I'd like to talk with you. Well, that's what we do. Uh, we're supposed to do. And some he chastised. Some he chastised with words. Some I've chastised with words because they were having problems, but it was not a, they, they made it to sound uh, as a physical, not a physical, but a material problem of the world. But in truth, it was a spiritual problem. And spiritual problems are not, uh, uh, you don't get the results or get the effects or the cure for spiritual problems out of just, uh, listening to some pastor. You get it out of the Word of God. And you let God come in and change your heart and turn things around. So some I have chastised too. And uh, uh, some uh, he shoveled in. It really, when you, list, list, uh, when you look the words up, you study the words and so forth, it means shoveled in. He, he, he just pour out everything to him. 
uh, fill him full of the Word of God and, and, uh, and, and with his teaching. And that helped reform them. You know, when you're reformed, you're changed. I heard a message uh, at a funeral uh, last week, I think it was. And um, uh, I was involved in it, but I, I wasn't in the, the message inside. And uh, he told, he said, you know, I quit asking people if they want to be saved or if they're saved. This pastor did. And he said, uh, he said uh, anybody can say I'm saved. <coughs> He said, but have you had a change in your life? You see, when you trust in Jesus Christ, you're, you're a new creature. Behold, all things have become new. You're not the same. And, and there should be a change. I know there was a great change in me when I got saved. But you could see the change in me because I was so bad when I was bad. Amen. That's right. And uh, my wife knows. She knows it all. And, um, and so we understand that and that there should be a change. And, and I, I let God have me. And I've let him have me again on a couple of occasions uh, since I have been saved. I've given myself over to his will. And I'm glad I did. I wouldn't change anything in that. Praise be to God. And so he had changed people. He had, he had caused them to reform. And you, he had, he had strengthened, it says. Well, he fortified them with words that made them courageous. You know, uh, one of the things that Christians need to be is courageous. This, uh, this is a pretty terrible world we live in. You could lament a lot of things about this world that we live in. If you think it's going to get any better, well... You know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I'll tell you what, I hope Jesus comes Amen. soon Amen. for what I see. And I trust God, and I know God is here, and He's with us, and He's still in it. But this is part of a judgment, I believe, against uh, God's people. And you know, we created this by allowing things to go on for years. I'm part of that. Because as a uh, a man that was born in 1947, uh, just uh, shortly after World War II, and then uh, uh, living through the 60s, which was a defining moment in America, as it turned from God into the things that were not of God. And on it goes, and here we are. But you have to be courageous to live in this uh, life, and to some, his words and actions made their weak hands, uh, well, let's call it uh, failing hands or, I don't know, let's see, idle hands. Uh, a lot of it uh, we call uh, things of life or really things we create in life. <laughs> Sometimes we think, we say, well, life's not doing well for me today. But you know, we have idle hands. A lot of people say, I don't have any money. Well, they don't go get a job either, and they need to. And I'm happy to support people who are actually trying to do something. Uh, I, I pour out to them in my heart, and we give money, and we do things, and this church does too. We, we have a backpack ministry and other things. We, we're all for people being better, living and having a better life. But i got to tell you, you just don't dream it. You have to have God in your life and do the things that God wants you to do and let Him bless you. And it wasn't in the message, so that's just that extra. I'm not charging another dime for that. You know, we, uh, we just uh, look at things in the wrong way sometimes. Idle hands, slack hands. And uh, when He bolsters you up, he makes you, uh, well, sure to him. He ensures in you that you have him working in your behalf. I've told everybody here and other people too. The whole time I was not saved, I lived in fear. And, and I was a controlling kind of person. So what I couldn't control, I feared. Now, many of you have never had that problem. 
But I did. But after I got saved, I was not afraid anymore. I, I, things in life didn't bother me like they did before. And I was not, uh, it took me a little while, but I, I, I finally reached a point to where I said, I'm in control of nothing, and so I give it all to God. And that's when it changed. I mean, that's when things really started to happen. Well, you know, this is what's happening. That's what happened when Job talked to people. This was a man of God. He was righteous before God. In verse 4 here of uh, chapter 4, it says, Thy words, or your words, Job, have upheld him that was fallen, and thou hast strengthened strengthened the feeble knees. And what he meant is his discourse. You know, uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a discourse of Christ. And he explains uh, what it is to be saved, how to be saved. And that whole discourse is the discourse for life. Without it, you don't have life because you don't have him. And you don't have the spirit of God. And it was dealing with troubles and uh, with uh, the troubles has uh, confirmed in many who were falling and who were bereaved. You know, I, I almost look at uh, uh, the people uh, in this message right here and people in the world today as being many of them bereaved or saddened by their condition and the condition of the world, knowing not what needs to be done. There's so many people out there that really would like to have a change, and, but they don't know how to go about it. They don't know what to do. And they don't know uh, what it would be and how it would uh, 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 look in them. So far they've been in, uh, overthrown in sorrow. And, uh, and he is saying that you have been fortified uh, through surety of God's work. In other words, it's a building process. I'm a lot stronger in my Christianity today than I was the first day I got saved. I can't tell you I'm more spiritual in it. I am. But I can't say that I'm more uh, uh, deep in it. Except I am. But I can tell you that I am stronger in it. Which I am. And which you are too. As you grow and you grow in holiness, you get stronger. You get more courageous. You get fortified. You, your bones are, uh, your whole body, your whole being, your whole spirit starts to take on a form that's strength and courageous. And the knees don't sink like they used to. You don't fall to the ground when things happen like you used to. Well, Job uh, was a man of renown. And in his position before God, let's look at that. Job chapter 2 and verse 3, it says this. And uh, all the sons of uh, God had come before him. That was all the angelic beings. And Satan was there too. And, uh, and the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, and perfect and upright man, one that fears God and eschews or avoids evil? And still he holds fast his integrity, although you moved me against him to destroy him without cause. That's God speaking to Satan. And he said, you know, he is a, a perfect man. In other words, a complete man. A man who's full of the Spirit. Uh, they didn't, uh, the Spirit didn't indwell people at that time. But he had that working in him, and he responded to the Spirit. And he did the things of God and he kept the law of God as much as you could do it. As people of God, uh, we are expected by other people to do, to live as we tell others to do and live. Now, point number one is that we are looked upon, if we claim the name of Jesus, uh, we are looked upon as Christians and people of God. And so they want to see something that proves it. Can anybody say amen about that? Amen. It is. We're not, a, we're not on an island by ourselves. 
And we're living in the world. We're in the world. We're just not of the world. And when people look at us, they want to see something different. And many times they're disappointed because they don't. I always have that in my mind because there are sometimes I want to lash out at somebody or do something that's stupid and uh, I have to remember that God is watching and so are other people. What if that person who was watching was one that was actually seeking God to be saved? And my actions caused them not to be interested anymore. You see, we have to be that kind of people. That's the kind of person that Job was. When people were in trouble, they went to Job. Because he had a great life going on. And, uh, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, it's not... Uh, well, I think it was my mother who used to say this. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure. It sounds like something she said. She said, don't do as I say, do as I do. But you know, a lot of people say, say that, and they're not doing the right things. You see, uh, it should be, do as I do, not what I say, do as I do. Because the real, the real person is what that person is doing. If that person has a, has a lifestyle, a tendency for a lifestyle that's not of God, well, it doesn't matter if he says, I sure love God. You do? How do you show it? Who could see him? Who could see him in your life? You see? This is what he's saying. People of God are expected by other people to do and to live as we tell them to do or live. You can't counsel for people and tell them to do one thing when you're doing something else. Amen? Amen? That's right. We've got to be who we say we are. And follow, you know, they, they ask them to follow your example. That's what Paul did several times. He asked them to follow his example. Well, he wouldn't have followed, asked them to follow his example if his example was not a good one. I mean, that we know of. Paul, yeah. Now in verse 5 here, uh, Job 4 says, But now it has come upon thee, and thou faintest. It touches thee, and thou art troubled. Here's the point. Here, here's the real point. You see, the revealing statement against Job's actions in his, uh, by his friend Eliphaz uh, is in this verse. But now... The conditions that he counseled other people in. Somebody comes to him and they've lost a loved one and they wanted to talk to him and get some consolation. And, and he had the spirit uh, uh, working that would allow him to be able to give a consolation to them to help them. They were grieving. And now he has lost all of his children. He's lost all of his children. He's lost all of his possessions. He is covered with boils. And what it says then is, what this man is accusing him of is that it has come upon you and you have fainted. You have become weary to the fight and have been disgusted by what's uh, happening in, in your trials. You grieve for your past life. In other words, you long for the life before. Well, I, I know people have done that. I know people that were uh, said they were Christians and they may have been, but they got off on something else and they went the wrong way. And <laughs> at the bottom of that, we always had a statement when I was in YDC's, working in YDC, and uh, uh, in jail ministry. We, had a, we always had a statement. Have you reached the bottom yet? Have you reached rock bottom? Have you gone down as far as you can go? Are you now ready to come up? Are you ready to come back to God and come up? There was a very valid question. So what happened is, is that you remember that Job repented 
in sackcloth and ashes. And he anointed his boils. But he was in lamentation. He was in deep sorrow. And I'm sure he had counseled people to look to God. Keep your eyes on God. He may have given them some verses and some scripture if there was any scripture before him. And he, he knew the things of God, though. He knew creation and knew who God was and what he was, and what he is today. And so what happened was his lifestyle changed and it showed in him and this man was accusing him of not being the man that he should have been. Well, that's probably true. He probably was. It touches you, he said, not someone else, but you, and now you are suffering. So, you know, people look at us and they say, well, how did he handle that? Or how did she handle that problem in life? And that gives them an indication of where you are and what you're thinking. Well, Job had never experienced anything like this, and he had the answers, the common answers, the things from the world that, that uh, people give as answers, but maybe he had never experienced, well, he hadn't experienced, this kind of sorrow, and he had never been this afflicted, and it was new to him, and you know what I have found is this. That accusing people of being in sin because they're struggling in life is a going nowhere policy. You can hang it up. That only makes it worse. What they need is some comfort and care. This man was not giving comfort and care. He was being judgmental. And he, he, he made it to be that, that uh, because of all his hidden sin, he was now under the uh, curse of God. Well, he was wrong. What Eliphaz can't see is that this has come to Job not because of sin in his life, but as we have seen, but as a test or example to the world and to Satan, whom God allowed to touch him. You understand, God cannot touch you. God, I mean, Satan cannot touch you lest God gives him permission. He can't do a thing. Mm -hmm. Unless God gives him permission. And then when he does, he can't do any more than he gives him power to do. And we have more power in us to overcome him than to succumb to him, that being Satan. And I believe it was uh, God's uh, power to deliver in the end for which Job was suffering in this trial. He set him on a pedestal. He built a hedge about him. He was protected. There is no doubt about it. I, I'm protected too. Anybody that's a believer is protected by God. And but God releases his protection sometimes to see how you respond, to test you, uh, for you to be an example to others, and to maybe uh, work a work in you that you need, something in you may need to be changed. There's always a reason, but it's not to cause you to fall. It's to cause you to glorify him. That's the job of Christian. Now, in verse 6, Eliphaz goes on. He says, Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and the uprightness of thy ways? What's he mean? Is not your fear, the fear of being uh, out of the head, uh, uncovered 
having the heads uncovered from you? Isn't your fear uh, not having hope in life? Isn't it your fear uh, of not having the uh, power to deliver yourself and being separated from God and, and having your public image uh, damaged? <coughs> I know people whose public image is more important than Jesus. It's not to them what they do, it's if, just if they get caught. Y'all get that? Sometimes it's not what they do. The sin is not what they do. The sin is getting caught. There's a lot of people like that. And I include Christians in that too. And But a lot of Christians have this protection of their public image. image. And, and, it, and in the scripture it says it turned to silliness and folly and the uprightness of your ways, your hope through confidence is now tethered to uh, fear and folly. Your moral innocence and your course of life has been trodden under by compromise. That was the accusation against, uh, against Job. And some of it may have been true in the way that he was uh, acting. Now, chapter 4, 7, and 8. Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished, being innocent, or where uh, were the righteous cut off? Verse 8. Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Now, he is saying this to the man, the very man, that God said to Satan, Have you considered my uh, man Job? He is righteous in all his ways. Does that sound like a person who is involved in deep sin and, and is, uh, he is just hiding who he really is? I don't think so. And, and uh, the one that being cut off from God. Now I have to say that I do believe that Job had pride in his life. He was a prideful type man. I think that comes from being sometimes uh, God uh, puts us in a bad place because we build up pride sometimes we think we can do everything ourselves anybody else been guilty of that I, am. I think I can do that uh, and I kind of leave God out of it I did it used to uh, I kind of left God out of some things and all it did was give me grief because I can't do anything without God and I think maybe maybe uh, the fact that that uh, Job had not been tried before uh, bursted his bubble, and and, uh, and and it threw him in a tailspin, and and he had to come back. But accusing him of things and and being that kind of person is not going to do that, and did not do that. If a person plows in iniquity and sows wickedness, that person will reap the same. Well, that's true. But he had not reaped the same for that. Eliphaz, a sin lies at your door, ergo Job's troubles. He says, well, sin lies at your door. But you know, sin didn't lie at his door. I'm going to be as quick as I can. I have to have notes because I get lost. And I can't remember things. Two things. Or three. Don't be holier than thou when talking to others about problems in their lives. I've already said it, but I'm saying it again. Uh, nobody that's in this place right here has not, has not had a sin in their life. Everybody here has suffered from something in life. Some of us are still suffering from things that happened in life and still struggling with things in life, me included. Everybody does. And people have to understand that you're dealing with, and you may be dealing with somebody in the days to come, is that you have problems too. In other words, there's nothing wrong with saying, oh, I understand those things. I've suffered those things too. 
or I'm challenged on that every day of my life. There's nothing wrong with that. Because what you want to do is show them that it can be overcome. Amen? Amen. So we're, we're not taking a place of superiority. We're, we're letting them know that we have problems also and explain how you gain victory through God's Word. They want to know, how can I overcome this? You're already an overcomer. First John says you're an overcomer. Because Christ is an overcomer. He overcame it all. Overcame it all. Don't automatically judge that person's troubles are a matter, a matter or a result of sin in their life. I want to make this point again too. But do address sin when it comes up. Listen to people. We have a tendency to want to tell them everything which they can't, they can't understand for the most part. Even a Christian can't take everything in at one time. I mean, it's an impossibility. They're fighting their own war and they, you're trying to tell them a bunch of things. I'm not saying you are, but people do. People are trying to tell them everything they need to do. When they need to stop in their tracks, go back to the Word of God. Take the Word of God. Let the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, be the teacher. You're not the teacher. You're the one doing some teaching with them, but the Spirit of God is doing the teaching in you to give to them through the Word and in them through the Word to do the things that need to be done. And as you come across sin in their lives, then explain it to them and tell them as you understand what's wrong. And then be true. This is it. Whatever you tell a person that needs to be done or how to live, make sure your, uh, your counsel matches the word in your own life. Make sure what you tell matches you in your own life. You can even say, I struggled with this. I, I've done some things as a Christian that I sure wish I hadn't done. Uh, I've, I've been a gossiper. Or I've been a, uh, I've had a few drinks or uh, things of this nature. I've done things that are not of God because they don't lead to things that are of God. And um, and I've struggled with that, but I've overcome it. Here's how I overcame that. Here's what God did to bring me from that. But be true. So we would say then, do as I do. Not just as I'm saying. What I'm saying to you today, I do in my life. Follow my life if you want to. But follow God. Follow the Spirit of God. Follow Christ, His example. And keep your eyes on me. I want to be a testimony before you. Not in pride, but in trying to help somebody overcome. Now, one last thing. Paul was on Malta. This will really bring out the point. Paul was on Malta. They had shipwrecked, and they were on Malta, and tribes there got them and brought them you know, up to the land, and, and they uh, they built a fire. They had a fire going, and they were cooking some uh, fish and, and making some bread. And Paul went over to the fire. He was going to help out, like he always did. And he went over to the fire, and he reached down to get some wood to put on the fire, and a snake got him. And he clasped hold of his hand. I just see it getting about right here. And like my son did that time, he had a snake, and it was biting him here, and he was carrying it around. And I thought, you're a sick young man. Right? Anyway, this he got bit, and he had it, and they watched him, and he finally got it off, and he threw it in the fire, and it burned up. So now they're all sitting there peering at him, you know, looking and saying, he must be a murderer. 
because a snake has bit him. And he's up to no good. So they were waiting for him to swell up, the Bible said, or fall over dead. And nothing happened. And it went on for a little while and nothing happened to him. He didn't feel anything. He didn't, nothing took place. Well, they called him a murderer and so forth before because they judged him because he must have sin in his life. He got bit by a snake. But after they found out that he didn't die or get sick, they said he must be a prophet. He must be a man of God because he didn't get sick. Well, isn't that the way people are in life? They judge people by what happens to them. And that's not always correct. In fact, it's very rarely correct. But some things are. But they never, they, they first thing they did was he's a murderer. Next thing, well, he's blessed of God. He must be God's man. He, they, in fact, I think they, one of them said he may be a God. We need to do the things that are right. Job is a great book of examples. If you've never read it, you need to read it. And you need to read it with the understanding that you're going to get something from it because I will assure you, you will get something from the book of Job. All right. Well, praise God today. And I hope you did get something from what we preached and that you'll get things uh, in the days to come. Let me have prayer, and uh, then we'll finish up. Father, thank you again for your work, your message, and uh, what you give to me, and I try to give it to others as much as I can, and as, as good as I can. And uh, uh, you know my limitations. And uh, Father, I, I uh, ask you to touch me and help me to be better in that, uh, to have healing in that, but I just ask you to use me in whatever way, really. Whatever you want me to do. And I pray for this church that we'll be like that, too. We'll be people who want to be your people. I know we are. But there may be something we're not doing or something that somebody here is being called upon to do that hasn't responded yet and needs to. And that we might be blessed here and we might be a blessing to other people. That's really the message. And that we approach people with a, uh, with a low, lowlier attitude. That we're not even as uh, mean as much as they do. That we're humble, contrite in the Spirit. And Father, that we might be able to do something for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.